the teachers, their caregivers, God, just anybody that's around them, that you would just make them to be lovers of Jesus, God. Father, and we pray that, um, especially for their parents, that they would have strong, healthy marriages and relationships so that they can see um, how much you love the church by the way their parents love each other, God. We have so much more to pray, but Lord, we commit them to, to you and to your will and to your protective power and the word that's able to build them up. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Y'all are going to that room on that wing. I think Holly's office. And I think Beth is coming. Yeah. All right. Eddie's already said it once, but I'll say it again. We're so thankful that you're here this morning. Um, we know that, that sometimes, and for some of you that may be coming into a, a church building, might be difficult because you've experienced things in the past that maybe weren't so good. Maybe um, you've experienced church hurt. Maybe you're anxious. You don't like big crowds, whatever it is. Um, and we just want to thank you and, and tell you that we honor um, and admire your, your courageousness because it does take a lot of courage for some people to come into church. And so we want to let you know that we acknowledge that and we honor that. Thank you for being here and thank you for, for trusting us um, with, with God's word and to, and to talk about it with you and to speak it over you because that takes trust too. And, um, and so we acknowledge that. We're thankful for that and, and really, really happy that you're here. Um, next week, God willing, we're going to start the sermon series in Matthew. Uh, wasn't quite ready for preaching this week, so we're going to push it back one more week. And, then, um, and so I thought instead we'll just pick on the rich young ruler again. Um, since we picked on him last week, we'll just, we'll just keep picking on him again this week. Um, but part of the reason that I want to talk about the, the rich young ruler, the blind man, and Zacchaeus is because um, when we read some of these stories that are in the Gospels, I don't, I don't think that we necessarily cast ourselves in, uh, in the proper character. Right? We'll, we'll read some of these stories, and <laughs> we're everybody but the rich ruler, you know. Um, we're more like Zacchaeus or the humble um, blind man that calls out for mercy. But when, um, when we take a close look at our lives and, and the way that sin works, right, and just being people, um, there's a lot to learn from, these, uh, from, these, from the account, that these narratives that are, in, that are in the gospel. So we're going to be in Luke 18, verse 9 through chapter 19, verse 10 today. And before I say anything else, I want to go to God in prayer, and then we'll, we'll jump right in. Lord, thank you so much for all the people that are here today, the people that are watching, and we just pray a prayer of blessing over them, over me, as I speak your word, Lord, I pray that you would uh, implant it deep in my heart uh, so that I can be the kind of person that embodies the things that he preaches about, um, that, that I can bear this fruit in my own life with my, with my wife and my children. Um, and so I pray especially for me. Also pray, Lord, for protection. We know that when your word is preached, when the seed is sown, that the enemy's active, and it falls on all different types of soil. But I pray that the soul here in this building this morning would be rich, fertile, uh, that it would be able to receive the implanted word, which is able to save our souls, to build us up, and to give us a place among those who are sanctified um, in your great name, Lord. We're thankful for Christ, for all that he's done for us, and I pray that his sacrifice would loom large in our minds as we, as we read this, God, um, and I pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. If, if you guys think your life is difficult, the people in that wing, man, they, whew, they're <laughs> so appreciative of our volunteers. It takes so many volunteers to make it happen, and, uh, but man, we're, we are, we're thankful. There's so much gratitude. Oh, and by the way, I want to thank you all before I get any further into this. Um, Y'all threw me a, a Holly, a surprise 40th and 30th birthday party Sunday night, and um, man, just... I spent my 40th birthday just overwhelmed with gratitude. Um, it was very humbling to just see the outpour of love that, that you guys showed me. Um, it's a privilege to be a part of your life. I think that um, one of the hard things about being a pastor is the people. And one, <laughs> one, one, of, the, but one, of, the, one of the nice things, the privileges is the people because you, they let you into parts of your life that they don't let anybody else in. Uh, 
but they let their family in. And so there's so much responsibility that comes with that. And um, it's so humbling just to be able to sit back and reflect that, that I have, um, that I've impacted you in some way um, and that you, you thought that that was, um, and that I was worthy of celebrating, my life was worthy of celebrating. And so it was just really wonderful to be able to celebrate that with you. And then to sit down and write what, everything that happened between ages 30 and 40 um, and, and just really reflect on some of those things. It, it was really humbling. And so thank you. Thank you so much for, for doing that for me. Um, it, was, it was very, very special. Okay. One of the reasons it's important to look at Luke chapter 18, verse 9, and uh, all the way through chapter 19 um, is because there's not much different from some difference between somebody who is uh, lawless and what I mean by lawless is like, you know, somebody just living by the world, doing their thing, um, and, and somebody that is a, a Christian but is more legalistic. Um, all it takes for a lawless person to become legalistic is, is religion. Um, and, and the reason that is is because what, what we do as people, right, as, as people, we, we seek justification for the things that we want to do. It doesn't really matter if those things harm us or harm other people. We want to feel justified in the decisions that we make and the choices that we make. And religion, especially Christianity, offers justification through Jesus Christ. And if you accept that gift or that offer of justification, but the heart hasn't changed, one of the things that you'll notice people do is they actually, they take the structures of religion, okay, and they use them to actually not only hide their lawlessness, but uh, put on a false righteousness, and what happens when, when, when this happens, something really interesting, a dynamic occurs within the church. So when we look at somebody whose life is not dedicated to Christ and they're walking in self-destruction and all the things, and as a Christian, we would look at that and say, that's, that's not the life that we want to live, right? But if you take that same person and you put them in a religious environment and they are really good at building the structures of religion to cover up and to hide the things that they're doing, the, the, the very person that we will kind of say, I don't want that, Right? When, they, when they are in the church, Christians will follow that person. Um, and so what we have, the story of the rich young ruler, the blind man in Zacchaeus, is a demonstration of the heart that, that Jesus um, wants, the heart that's acceptable to, to God. And so we're going to look at Luke 18, verses 9 through 17 first, the Pharisee, the tax collector, and the infants, and then show how Luke, in, in the remaining of that chapter and in chapter 19, piles on different narrative events to kind of prove his point. And one of the reasons, another reason we're doing this is because when you, when you read the gospel, there's a, the gospels in general, there's a temptation to just go and, and to read each of the stories as if they just exist on their own, right? And so in Luke 15, you have the parable of the lost sheep, then the parable of the lost coin, the parable of the prodigal son. And if you're, if you're not really thinking about it, it just seems like a a collection of parables or a collection of narrative events, right? And you're just left knowing a whole lot. Well, yeah, I remember when Jesus did this, and I remember when Jesus did that. But one of the things that, that we fail to notice is that the author is taking these, these separate accounts and narratives and parables, and, and he's, he's sewing them together in the, in the, the tapestry of the, the point that he's trying to make. And so when you look at Luke 18, you'll see how, a point's introduced in a gospel, and you have a parable, a story, a parable, a parable, a story, and, and how all of those parables and the narrative functions to prove the author's point. So when you do that, it really changes the way you read the gospel. It's not just a collection of events that happen, maybe in sequential order, maybe not, but um, it, it becomes, oh, okay, the, what the author is trying to do is he's trying to show me what my heart should look like, and then he's, he's using examples of these people that I can take and apply and, and, and come to a fuller and more robust understanding of Christ. So, Luke 18, verse 9, this is what Jesus says. It's a parable. He told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. So there's your audience. They trust themselves that they're righteous, and the people that don't live up to their billing, they treat them with contempt which shows that the, they weren't really righteous to begin with. It starts, it's very ironic, you know. Um, but here's what happened. Two men went up into the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, a Jewish leader, a certain sect of Judaism, and the other a tax collector, despised by the Jews and, well, and Americans today. Uh, the Pharisee, standing by himself, prayed thus, God, 
How think you that I'm not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even like this tax collector? I fast twice a week, I give tithes of all that I get. But the tax collector, standing afar off, would not even lift his eyes up to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. That's a, that's a kingdom reality, a kingdom paradigm that, that Luke introduces with the story of the, the Pharisee and the tax collector tax collector that Jesus tells, all right? Immediately following, in verse 15, you have an event, all right? All these events are going to play in, they're going to they're create that, that story. Um, now they are bringing even infants to him, that Christ might touch them. And when the disciples saw it, they rebuked the people that brought the, the children. But Jesus called to them saying, let, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of heaven. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter. And so you've got two different groups of people. You've got the, the Pharisees, okay, on one hand, and they trusted themselves uh, that they were righteous and treated others with contempt and actually said, God, I thank you. I'm not like other men, this, this tax collector over here. And, and Jesus says, well, would it be that you were like this tax collector because he went down to his house justified, but then he presses the point home a little bit further and and says the comparison, you you Pharisee, is a deadly comparison because what you should really strive to be like is is not like this tax collector, but like this infant. That's the the point he makes Um, when he says, let the children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belong the kingdom of God. And so tax collectors and infants represent Christ for mercy or milk and what it looks like to be a citizen of the kingdom. And so that's what you have. You have the two groups of people here. And that's that's what he points out. Jesus says, the people that function over here as an infant, they will receive justification. The self-sufficient, prideful, arrogant, give me the rules, I can keep up with it. They won't experience that. Then he dives right into some narrative accounts that reinforce his main point in Luke chapter 18. And the first one is, one of my favorite characters, right? He gets picked on again, the rich ruler. And um, what I've done on the next slide is I've put the rich ruler, the blind man, and Zacchaeus together to show um, how these characters relate. Now, and a ruler asked him, a good teacher, what must I do to inherit life? And Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good except God alone. You know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Honor your father and mother. And he says, all these things I've kept from my youth. And when Jesus heard this, he said to him, one thing you still lack. Sell all that you have and distribute to the poor. And you will have treasure in heaven. And come, follow me. But when he heard these things, he became very sad, for he was extremely rich. Jesus, seeing that he had become sad, said, How difficult it is for those who have wealth to enter the kingdom of God. For it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God. Those who heard it said, then who can be saved? And Jesus answered, what is impossible with man is possible with God. And we're going to skip verses 28 through 34, and we're going to come back to them. All right, so we have the rich ruler. And here's a couple of things to notice, all right? When he comes to Jesus, nobody grumbles, all right? And that's not a big, like, okay, does that make, all right, that's, that's fine. Something to, to remember as we read, okay? That's the first thing. Here's the second thing. He's not a youth. And so what, you know, Luke includes that. All these things I've kept from my youth, because to let us know, hey, this isn't some infant, this isn't some child. Um, the rich ruler is self-sufficient, he's wealthy, he's blind as a bat, bless his heart. I mean, he comes to the giver of everything and doesn't see it. And then lastly, he leaves this situation full of sorrow, all right? So, so keep those in your mind, or we just looked at them on the screen. And we'll go right to the blind man, and we'll start to see the way that Luke contrasts the way that he tells his story to kind of highlight some of the differences, all right? Verse 35, as Jesus drew near to Jericho, 
a blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. So he's already different from the character we just read about, isn't he? He's, he's begging. He's poor. He's blind. There's something that's keeping him from actually being a self-sufficient person in this society. And hearing the crowd going by, he inquired what this meant. And they told him, Jesus of Nazareth, Nazareth is passing by. And he cried out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Does it sound familiar? We were just told in Luke 18 that the tax collector went up to the temple to pray. And what was his prayer? Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. You keep all these things in your mind. You see what the author is doing here. And those who were in front rebuked him. Does that ring a bell? The last time that word rebuke is used is when the infants are brought to Jesus. It didn't happen with the rich young ruler, but the blind man, absolutely. Telling him to be silent. But he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. And Jesus stopped and commanded him to be brought to him. And when he came near, he asked him, what do you want me to do for you? He said, Lord, let me recover my sight. And Jesus said to him, recover your sight. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he recovered his sight and followed him, glorifying God. And all the people, when they saw it, gave praise to God. And so we already see a, a comparison, right? Rich young ruler approaches, everybody's down with it. They're, they're, they're down like a rodeo clown. They know, like, this is, these are the kind of people that get saved. When the blind man is brought, no, just like the kids. No, man, you stop, stop. You're embarrassing us. Stop. The blind man is associated with the children, right, because he's brought to Jesus. And that's, that's really subtle. The infants are brought to Jesus so that he might touch them. The blind man, Luke associates him with the children by him being brought to the Jesus, brought to Jesus. So there's two associations that take the blind man, put him in the category of infant. He's rebuked, just like the infants were, and then he's, he's brought. The next one is he seeks mercy, unlike the rich young ruler. What do I need to do to have life, right? And, and Jesus says, you know the commandments, and you can almost imagine the rich young ruler with his with his pen, he's like, okay, go. Okay, okay, I've done it. That's not the blind man. He seeks mercy. Rich young ruler is wealthy. This blind man is poor. The rich young ruler is blind, and this is one of the ironies of this story, is that the blind man, although he cannot see, actually sees what the rich ruler does not. He calls Jesus by his Davidic name, son of David, have, have mercy on me, which has a lot of rich Old Testament connotations. And unlike the rich young ruler, the blind man doesn't leave sorrowful. He leaves glorifying God, which brings us to the next character. And the final character, Zacchaeus, right? And um, I think this portion of the, the, of the comparison will be really short. Man, that went right over your heads. All right, all right. It's... it's no more little jokes. He entered Jericho and was, pa and was passing through. And behold, there was a man named Zacchaeus, a chief tax collector and rich. All right. So if you're thinking, if you're comparing and contrasting characters, we kind of see rich ruler, right? And he was seeking to see Jesus, who Jesus was. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. What we should have done is we should have, we should have ended this, this sermon with love lifted me. So we ran on ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree. I need to get it all out of my system all the, to see him. For he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. He's gone to be the guest of a man who's a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, half of my goods I give to the poor. And if I've defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it full, full, fourfold. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, since he is also a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came, came to seek and save the lost. So with Zacchaeus, we have some things that, you know, combine him or help us to relate to him as we do the infants is the blind man. Here's the first. Um, when Zacchaeus was brought to Jesus, when he was received by Jesus, the people grumbled. 
just like they did with the infants, just like they did with the blind man. They were perfectly acceptable with the rich ruler asking Jesus a question, but the people who they did not seem to fit the proper identity of a kingdom follower, can't believe it. Um, Zacchaeus, like, the ch- like children, is small in stature. Um, and number three, he is a tree lover. Zacchaeus is. But another, the reason I put that to get your attention, because I figure by this point you'd be falling asleep. But, um, <laughs> but uh, Zacchaeus is, the way that Luke takes Zacchaeus and puts him in the category of a child is, is by um, not only his stature, but also his activity. Grown people don't usually call, climb trees. Kids do. Um, number four, he's called by Christ. Unlike the rich young ruler, even though blind, the blind man and Zacchaeus both have obstacles that prevent them from seeing, he actually sees who Jesus is. And unlike the rich young ruler and like the blind man, Zacchaeus leaves glorifying God. And what Luke does in 18 and 19, right? is he shows us who belongs to the kingdom, and then he takes adults, right, infants. If you don't receive the kingdom of child like an infant, you'll never enter it. And then he takes adults and the different stories of the adults, and he shows us what it looks like when an adult has the attributes of an infant. It looks like the blind man who is begging for mercy and sees the value of Jesus, even though he's blind and leaves glorifying God. It's like Zacchaeus Although he's small in stature and the people don't want him to come, he's called by Christ and he sees Christ and he leaves glorifying God. And so what all do we get from this besides it's kind of cool a little bit? If you're like a Bible nerd and you like to read the Bible, this is kind of kind of neat. Here's some takeaways that I think really kind of make this hit home for us. Here's the first one. The, the, the first takeaway is the emphasis on these stories, the emphasis in these stories is on sight not one's ability to sell. And here's why I say that. A lot of, I've heard this sermon preached and grew up in a place where this sermon was preached. If only he could have sold it all. And I think that the people that say that, I mean, they're good, but I think that they, they kind of miss the point, right? Um, the rich young ruler, the, the, the thing, all three of these, these characters have something in common that prevents them, right, from entering the kingdom. And it's their, their ability to see. The rich young ruler is blinded by his riches. The blind man is blinded by his sight. Zacchaeus is so small he can't see over the people. That is the main, that is the point of contention that they can't see. That's why he brings these, the people they can't see. And he, and he sets them over against the rich young ruler to say, the, the, the reason the rich young ruler couldn't sell it is because he couldn't see it. And another reason I say that is because Zacchaeus voluntarily does half of what Jesus asked the rich ruler to do. He says, sell everything that you have and follow me. You have treasure in heaven. And while Zacchaeus says Jesus, he goes, I've sold half of what I own. You think, well, Well, he told the rich ruler he had to sell it all. Why does Zacchaeus only have to sell half? Because the point is not what they sell. That's not the point. I think that's one of the reasons this detail is added. It's not, we we would walk away thinking, well, if the rich young ruler could have just sold it all. Well, Zacchaeus only sold half. Because selling is not the point. Seeing is the point. The action carries him up to see it. The deaf man is hearing the commotion. What's going on? Oh, I want to see Jesus. Jesus, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. What do you want me to do? Just let me see. And, he res- and his sight's restored. Zacchaeus' sight is given. And when the, they see Jesus for who he is, they follow him and they glorify God. And so that is the main, what do we strive for in the church? For ind- us individually and for people who are lost, to help them see Jesus. To, to help them see Christ. The main obstacle that we have is that people can't see. 
So when the apostle Paul is called into ministry, he's, Jesus tells Paul, I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and receive a name by faith that is sanctified in me. That's the point. Uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verses 4 through 6. The God of this world has blinded the eyes of the unbelievers to keep them from seeing the glory of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ. But God, who says, let there be light, has shown in our hearts and has revealed the glorious, um, the glorious image of himself in the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is the main difference between people who believe and don't. One group can see and the other can't. And so the, the battle's not, to, well, what can I sell? What can I do? What list do I have to keep? That, once, you, once you see Christ for who he is, then what you'll find out is whatever you sell in his name, he will accept. So once, the, once Zacchaeus sees who Jesus is, he could give away a, half of it. What, Christ accepts it, not because... Not because it was, it was because he saw him. And so Zacchaeus sold a quarter of what he had. Christ would have accepted it because the issue is, can he see him? All right, that's the one takeaway is our labor is to see and to savor and to love and to have him planted in our hearts by the Holy Spirit, how wonderful Jesus is. And then, second point, if we approach Jesus with a list for life, He'll let us live according to that list, but will always leave sorrowful. He will. And that's, that's Old Testament. I mean, well, and that's Paul, right? Whoever, should, whoever wants to be justified by the law shall live by it. If you fall short in one point, you fall short of the whole thing. And so if you come with a list and you say, all right, Jesus, he'll go right to the heart. And then whatever, this is, this is the s sad part of not seeing Jesus. We'll come to him with a list. He'll go right to the heart. And the thing that he tells us to do that's good for us will bring us such sorrow that we'll walk away from him. And I think that it's natural to look at what Jesus asked the rich ruler to do and say, that's a demand. Look at what Jesus is demanding him to do. But if you, if you think about the way Jesus works, sell everything you have and give to the poor is not a demand. It's, it's, a, it's a cure. It's this is good for you. What, what you need, you are so enslaved to your stuff. You, have, you are so enslaved to your stuff, what you really need is to not have it because you don't own it, it owns you. And we walk away saying, well, look at the demand that he made on him. Well, what Jesus, when he presses into our lives and we begin to see who he is, what we begin to see any demand that Christ puts on us is for our healing, it's for our health, and it is for our good. That, that's why it's here. It was, he asked the rich ruler to do it because the rich ruler would actually be better off if he did it. But if we're blind to Jesus, we'll say, can you believe that? Big jerk. I mean, this is what gives me my prestige. People, I'm respected in this community. I mean, I got all kinds of security from these riches over here. I can buy medicine. I can buy food. I can buy the certain kind of clothing that makes people think that they should rob me. I saw that story like you can't, I think it was some university, you can't wear a certain, side of, certain kind of jacket or you'll get mugged, right? But that's okay, I can buy a gun. And I wear my fancy jacket and have my gun. Try to take it. Right? There's <laughs> and and what, what Jesus says, if you'll just see me, if, if you'll see me, the things, the, the, the beatitudes, the teachings of Christ become the fruit of being in the kingdom. Now, this is the good news of all of it. It's the part I skipped over. Um, when the disciples heard what Jesus said to the rich ruler, they said in verse 26, then who can be saved? If this guy can't make it in, there's no chance for me. What is impossible with man 
is possible with God. Verse 27. Verse 31. And taking the twelve, he said to them, See, we are going up to Jerusalem, and everything that is written about the Son of Man by the prophets will be accomplished. For he will be delivered over to the Gentiles, and he will be mocked, and shamefully treated, and spit upon. And after flogging him, they will kill him. And on the third day, he will rise. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This is the the good news of these stories, right? Is that when we come to Christ with the attitude of the rich ruler, which we do, we do. That's why if an unbeliever gets something that we've been praying for, That's why we question God, whether or not he's just. is because we've come to him in the spirit of the rich ruler. When we judge another Christian for partaking in a freedom that we have decided is just wrong, right? And and we we pass judgment on them. That that is the spirit of the rich ruler. It's the spirit that says, I'm saved by grace through faith. And then it takes this whole thing and it turns it into a law book. And then it actually creates division within Christianity about who is more of a Christian or who is a better Christian. Right? And we do it. That's why Arminian people don't like Reformed people. That's why Reformed people don't like Arminian people. That's why people who worship with instruments love everybody. And that's why the people who don't, who don't worship with instruments don't like the people that do. <laughs> I'm just playing. That's a joke. But I mean, but, but we do. That, that's, just the, that's just what we do. I can't believe you're not Catholic. Well, I can't believe you're not Methodist. Well, I can't believe that you're not Baptist. Well, I can't believe you don't know what you are. And so, and, we, and, and we, we come with that attitude, right? We come to that attitude, and it's completely different from an infant or from a blind man that just desperately wants to see or a short man who likes to climb trees so that he can see. It, we, Christ died to purchase us to seek and to save the law so that we can actually take some of these stories and go man i've actually come to god feeling like he owes me something and a, a lot of theologies and philosophies have been written by men who ask god a question at the premise of it it is that god owes humanity something And for those of you who've had an infant, all they do is cry. They cry out for milk. And Jesus died so that we can cry out for for mercy. And so my prayer this morning is that if you're not a Christian, that you will see Jesus Christ, that the Holy Spirit will come and open your eyes and that you will cry out for mercy. And if you are a Christian, that we would kind of Embrace the kingdom mentality of humility, Christ-likeness, of a sinful childlike faith, and that one voice will glorify God by coming to the giver of every good and perfect gift, God Almighty, and the gift he gave us through Christ his Son. Let's pray together. Father, thank you so much for the way that you love us. We're thankful that um, we have your word, that we can come to it, and we can get life from it and sight from it lord i grant us a heart that sees your goodness and your mercy lord i pray that you would just break us of any pretentiousness that we might have when we approach you lord i pray that you would break us of um that mindset that feels like you owe us something an explanation a particular specific prayer request um an answer that, that you would help us to to see that you are a king with a kingdom and the people who are in your kingdom you love indescribably well and perfectly. And the things you give to us are for our good and the things that you ask of us are for our good and that we might um, receive God with a pure heart, which receive all that you are for us in the person of Jesus Christ. Grant us repentance leading to the knowledge of, of the truth, God. We pray that you would be, be, thank you for your patience. We know that your kindness 
is meant to bring us to repentance, Lord. It's meant to bring us to a change of heart and a change of mind. And, and I pray you would help us to start to see things in your kingdom a little differently than we see them in ours or in the kingdom of the world or in the kingdom of the house that we grew up in. That You, we would, you would teach us what it means to be citizens of your kingdom, Lord, who don't point the finger in judgment but, but cry out for mercy. We love you and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We don't if, stand. If you're not a, a Christian, um, one of the things that we, we offer every week is, is people up here to pray with you. And if you will come see me, I'd, I'd love to talk to you about a relationship with Jesus and what it means to see Jesus. And, um, and we would love just to partner with you and to walk with you through that. And, and so I'll be up here um, as well as um, Eddie will be up here to receive you in prayer. John and, and Brittany is up here. For if a lady, if you're more comfortable with a with um, a lady praying with you, she'll be up here to receive you too. But we're gonna we offer that to you. If you want to come up and pray, it's open. Why don't you come while we while we stand and worship together? Please stand.